Kia ora koto, everybody. Welcome to Agility Matters. Tonight we have Troy May. He's a flaneur, which I was just told is French, which I can't pronounce, obviously. He's also a bit of a smuggler, long-term serial entrepreneur. We're going to talk about the entrepreneur aspect, the ups and downs, business in general. But we're going to flow into, I guess, strategy. But emergent strategy, responding to the changes in not only customer demand, but employee demands, cultural demands. Let's just crack into it. So, Troy, welcome to the show, mate. Well, thank you, Michael. Good evening. Good evening and good morning to those over in the UK. And um, if we have Russia online again, it's, it's very early for you guys. Um, to Troy, Flaneur. What? what so it's French. Well, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep going on about it. So where's, where's it from? It's, so it's, Fr it's French. It's it means uh, an observer, someone who's kind of well-to-do but a little bit outside of society that was used uh, in a slightly derogatory manner. Someone told me very recently that there was images of a guy in you know suit and tux walking his tortoise down the street. And he was called a flaneur. I stole the term from Nassim Taleb, <laughs> our, uh, our man of black swan fame. But I, I thought it was appropriate. I've spent a lot of time not quite fitting in, observing what's going on. Uh, I was a Kiwi lad growing up in the West who enjoyed reading books. Uh, not the, quite the right fit. I, I went to Australia as a Kiwi. I went to China as a, an outsider's perspective. I think that's weaknesses. Nice. Is, uh, flaneur. So when you explain that, knowing a little bit about you, I'm like, this makes sense now. This makes sense. So I'll, I will press you on it. So bit of an outsider, bit of a um, no doesn't mean no, right? So is that because you've always been a bit of a, you know, I'm going to push against the machine or just the fact is that you're, you're stubborn and refuse to quit? Um, neither. It's just... Neither? neither. Okay. I, I just spend a lot of time in my youth wasting it on books. <laughs> and what I was reading and what I was seeing, that there, there, there was differences. And as a Westie, someone who grew up in West Auckland in way back when, and still to this day, I think places like Massey don't have a lot going on. So observing was part of my nature. Sometimes observing and making comments on what I observed didn't go down too well with some people. I, lo I love that. Okay, cool. So when did you, because obviously you're serial entrepreneur, right? Yep. Very young age, because you, because uh, uh, the reason why I asked this, because I started reading massively at a young age, right? And I never read fiction. I always read nonfiction. I thought I was a genius by 17. Obviously not. Uh -huh. thought, I'd be, thought I'd be retired by 19. Obviously not. Mm -hmm. So how did business start for you then? Oh, I think my earliest business endeavor was my older sister was having a birthday party and some guys bought a lot of beer and some guys ran out of beer. And I was able to buy some from some guys at a cheap rate and sell it to the other guys for more. There was arbitrage. That was my first profit-making venture. <laughs> I love that. That's great. I, 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 uh, I'll, I'll add to that for myself. So I started uh, doing paper rounds. Right. Everybody wanted the paper round. I was the nice guy who got paper rounds. So I got paid 10 pounds for a paper round. And I paid someone eight. Beautiful. There you go. Bit of average pitch, right? Yeah. So that's all it was. I stored the papers at my house. And for some reason, no one asked questions of why Michael can deliver 2,000 papers in a week. <laughs> so how many paper runs did you build the empire up to? Only, I think it's nine. Nine rounds. Um, it all stopped because my sister got on because she wanted some extra money. Mm -hmm. And my mum clicked and said it was unfair to be taking money away from other people. And she rang up the people and reported me. Oh, come on, that's, that, that's not unfair. That's, you know, that's scaling the business. And what's amusing is my mum's a business owner. 
So I thought that was quite unfair at the time when I was a kid. I was like, this, this doesn't make any sense. You employ people at a lower rate than the value you're producing. You're, you're billing them out at a higher hourly rate, right? And she's collecting the, the difference. And yep. my problem is I would see stuff like that and I would argue the case. Uh, yeah. But mum, 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 mum was always right. Mum was always right. <laughs> so um, that, that was my first one. So that was about, I think it was about 12 or 13. And I never really stopped after that. Um, but obviously you, you, you carried on properly then. So, and you got to obviously China and Thailand and... Well, I, I didn't actually carry on properly. I was just a, a random, like dropped out of school, wasn't interested, didn't, mm. didn't feel like I'd fit into New Zealand, but I didn't actually know what was happening in New Zealand either, right? So I left when I was like 19, went to Australia, I jobbed around a bit, um, you know, had some work with a, a cool catering company. It was mustard catering and they were doing thousand dollar a head catering for uh, people like Robert Holmes Accord and Alistair Norwood and that mm. kind of crew, right? People with $50 million homes down on the Swan River, that, that wow. kind of deal. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was fun. I liked the rush of it. I liked the buzz of mm. setting up a party for a thousand people and it was a thousand dollars a head, right? And we'd back a five ton truck up to a bottle shop and empty the bottle shop and back it up to the party. What 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 time frame are we talking here? Thousand dollars in the eighties or? Yeah, yep, it would have been. Wow. Eighty eight, something like that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just after the stock crash. Wow. Okay. John Roberts, uh, multiplex in in Australia. Mm. Son's twenty first birthday. You know, pull up there with a marquee, doesn't fit. He says, "Cut it." I was like, "What? This is a forty thousand dollar marquee." He's like, cut it. <laughs> Call the boss. He's like, yeah, come back, get the old one. Quick. That's <laughs> brilliant. Just, just, uh, and the son for his 21st got a 21 foot uh, Bertram launch, and the 18 year old that got all shitty about it wow. got a brand new BMW, just shut him up. They had mental as, any pl mental as anything playing. Um, one of my family relations, Ricky May, was playing there. They were all getting, again, 40 grand a pop to turn up. We, oh. the glass that you're holding there, the wine glass, we were, um, Mustard Catering was leasing glasses out for the night, $9 per night for these crystal uh, champagne flutes. And mental as anything was drinking champagne and smashing the flutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've never been able to understand. Because um, so I, I grew up in, obviously, we talked about, talk about beforehand, I grew up in London, uh, mostly in the Southeast. We never saw wealth. Like we never saw um, BMWs or you know crazy wealth. Uh, in New Zealand, I think it's 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 much closer together. Yes. Uh, where we grew up, you know, I remember my mum telling me we can't afford to go to the other side of London to see our you know family. And it's like ten pounds of petrol. Mm. Just, you just couldn't afford it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it's really interesting. You come to this country, and um, you know, there's still a lot of people who are on the the low the low economical side. And yet they, they live so close to people who are in $50 million mansions. So did seeing that sort of drive you forward? Where did you go afterwards? I don't know. Here in New Zealand, it's tucked away. There's plenty of money here. It's tucked away. We don't talk about it so much, but there is a big gap. Um, yeah. and, but in Australia, just working in that environment, doing these shows and parties and stuff. I mean, like, you know, the Queen came to town. She drinks Dubonnet. Wow. I was going to talk about something, but I won't on that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, keep that for offline. Keep that for offline. Yeah, indeed. So <laughs> I've always, I was always into the martial arts. And mm. I was, I came across this guy in Perth and he was teaching the, the nature, the internal styles. He was a very cool guy. Um, but one of the guys I was training with said, oh, uh, I'm going to go up and study in Beijing. And I was like, you can do that. <laughs> and he was like, yep. Yeah. I said, would you mind if I came along with you? Mm. He's like, oh, mate, it's taken me six months to get all my paperwork together, and I'm going in three weeks. And I was like, oh, well, look, if I can get my paperwork together in three weeks, is it okay with you? And he was 
yeah, sure. And I got my paperwork done in three weeks. Uh, you know, I told my girlfriend, I'm going to Beijing. She's like, where's that? <laughs> I went into the catering company, you know, the mustard, and told my boss, um, I'm going to Beijing. He's like, where's that? <laughs> it, you know, this is in 89. And that, we- That's so hard to comprehend, obviously, nowadays. Yeah, but that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, China hadn't been open that long. Mm. It, it, it was opened in 76, but wow. it really started going there until the mid 80s, right? Wow. We, okay. We, we flew in and we knew nothing. I mean, like, it was hilarious. It was just, and, and I loved it because it was just so, it was so chaotically different from what um, anything I'd experienced before. And I just really, fit in it was something that i enjoyed the guy i was traveling with was hopeless he he was he was uh, unable to deal with it and that's okay and we flew in in um early may mm -hmm. 1989 and we went to tiananmen square and it was just packed you know and we had no clue what was going on there was over a million people in the square waving flags and chanting and all happy and singing songs and stuff. And we looked at each other and said, well, shit, where's the hotel? <laughs> and, off, yeah. and off we went. It was just such a radical place. And then when it all went to shit, we were kind of stuck there trying to figure out what to do. It was like, oh, where do we go? And we ended up going to Japan. Nice. Yep. And Japan, obviously, I remember when I was a kid, Japan was like China back then, right? It was producing everything. It was cheap. I'm assuming it was more Western back then? China, China back then was a totally different world. Um, yeah. It still is a different world, but to give you an example, I met my business partner the, when I returned to China. That was the following year in 19, early 1990. And he was earning 40 renminbi a month, which is about $6. Wow. Right? And I had tons of you know, rem, uh, Well, back then you, you couldn't spend local money and you couldn't spend US dollars. You had to have FEC, foreign, mm. ex foreign exchange certificates. Right, it was like yeah. travelers' checks for foreigners. There was, I remember one, those. There was one store in the entire city that sold bread, milk, cheese, you know, foreign foods, if you like. Wong is there earning 40 renminbi a month, but he didn't need the money. The done way your work mm. it covered everything, it provided you with the job, it provided you with accommodation, it provided you with. Uh, the education for your children, it provided your health service, everything, and including ration tickets. So we'd go to the markets and I'd go, oh, we get a couple, you know, we'll get some of that and some of this. Oh, uh, no. I was like, I got money, I get it. Uh, no, I don't have a ration ticket. Right? Wow. Okay. Yeah. He worked in a taxi dispatch office and to drive a car was a high level, high profile, good job, right? Yeah. Because cars were rare. To, to mm. actually be able to drive a car for a living, awesome. Mm. I can still remember my jaw dropping open after a couple of years in the early days, watching a family in a car. Oh my God, there's a family. It's a private car. Unbelievable, all right? That is you know, where China was. When we were up there, Beijing is got big central square mm -hmm. and it's got ring roads that go around the outside. Okay. They were completing the second ring road when we were there in the early days. I think they've finished the seventh ring road now. Yep. That's about right. And there's traffic jams for about three days. Um, <laughs> of all those cars. Yeah. You get used to traffic jams. Yeah, so you, so you travel around, obviously, China, Japan. Yeah, Japan, and then back to, well, back to Australia, back up to China. Um, mm. Ended up, <laughs> ended up 
uh, selling tickets on the Trans-Siberian black market tickets and then taking a train uh, from Beijing to Moscow uh, for about first class train tickets for about 20 bucks. Mm. Right. But again, that arbitrage that we were talking about a little bit yep. earlier, we, the, the, there was a couple of Polish guys who actually had New Zealand citizenship and they'd figured it out. They were buying tickets for nothing in Hungary and then yep. getting to Beijing. But what made them valuable was being able to book them. Like, yep. um, there's, you'd go to CYTS three, day, three months to the day in advance and book the mm. tickets. And then you tick, you had a ticket on the Trans-Siberian. But no, no backpacker or traveler wanted to come to Beijing three months to the day, go in a queue, yep. get that ticket validated. So there was some good money in it. And there was some companies been doing it yep. for years. And just for those who are listening, um, arbitrage is basically buying something and then selling it for more, something else, more profit, right? Yeah. I mean, you can think that's just normal business, right? The whole idea, though, is, and Troy, correct me if I'm wrong here from, from my definition, but it's meant to go away over time. Lots of companies use arbitrage, but the whole idea is it's, it's actually a decaying market because as the market opens, the arbitrage decreases over time. So you're meant to not have that opportunity over time. Well, the idea is you get competition. And that eats away at that delta on the on the arbitrage. But mm. if you can get enough scale and volume, then you've got a moat that can surround that arbitrage, a la Facebook, a la yeah. Google, a la, well, Apple to a certain degree, where yeah. it becomes very, very expensive to compete to eat into that arbitrage, right? Correct. You create a bit bigger barrier to entry. I guess the reason why I say that is because obviously we've got a lot of Kiwis on, on the line. And I feel like a lot of New Zealand business is arbitrage. It's because the global market barrier to entry was so difficult to come into this country that companies were able to basically buy goods from overseas and sell them to locals at higher prices. Right. And yet that's now decaying. Yep. And that whole like almost commoditization of a lot of markets has become such a, a problem that companies in New Zealand are just going under and under. If they don't innovate, if they don't have the right emergent strategy to actually completely change their direction based upon new information. So that's why I love that word because it's like arbitrage was, you know, it was in growing markets in bespoke things. It totally works. Mm -hmm. We talked about crypto a little, a little while ago off cam. Yeah. Arbitrage and crypto, totally. I can still today buy on one website and sell on another website of Bitcoin and make money. No. And I was doing not as much. Yeah. But I think it was 2016. Um, I could do that all day, every day, and make you know, a couple hundred bucks a week. Can't do it now, but but, but now there's like on uh, Ethereum chains and lots of other chains is now there's layer two arbitrage, where yeah. you buy and where, where you doing short term loans basically. I mean that's a, a bank's business is arbitrage. They get money in at X amount and then they've got to lend it out. Risk, you know, the funny thing about banking is it's about as risky as it gets. It's, it's amusing with banking, right? And I've worked for three major banks, uh -huh. four, four major banks. And I remember when I was in one of them, an Aussie bank, and um, we're having some wine. And obviously, my, my, I say things I shouldn't say when I'm drinking. And I said to them, you know, you know, banking won't be around in 20, 30 years time, right? Or if it's around, it'd be completely different. <laughs> and they laughed at me. And I said, well, here's the reasons why. Not only crypto, but the fact is that of decentralization, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, uh, all these things. I think it was 2016, 2015 at the time. And they laughed. Fast forward five years, and we've now got, uh, fine, it's still a tiny market, but crowdfunding's huge compared to what it was five years ago. Right, but how many I mean, people are crowdfunding their mortgages? Not yet. There's a, there's a blockchain for that. <laughs> it'd be an interesting mission to do the risk assessment i mean um yeah so harmony started right so harmony's got oh no squirrel i think squirrel's looking at doing mortgages and crowdfunding right um somebody correct me in the comments if i'm wrong there but i think that squirrel's starting to do it but it's very low risk mortgages so i was doing risk analysis at asb at the time 
when Harmony started doing variable loan rates. Yeah. Um, so we introduced variable loan rates at ASB. Right. But we still couldn't go lower than Harmony. Why? How did Harmony get the, the how did, where did their arbitrage advantage come from? Well, I, I think about this, right? So if I put money in the bank, I, well, at the moment, if I put money in the bank, I get 1%. You're getting, Troy, it, I'm getting 0.5 at the moment. Oh, geez, is it really that bad? Okay. Um, 0.5 then. Yeah, if I said to you, hey, Troy, give me a million dollars, I'll give you 5%. Mm -hmm. Fine, you got to trust me. But 5% for me is cheap as chips right now. Yeah. You know, if I want to get 100K, I've got to go for at least 9.95%. So crowdfunding, mm -hmm. the arbitrage is actually quite large. Yes. But the risk factor is too, is too big for most people. So, but if you were Troy, we're going to lend me a million dollars and I split it between a million people your risk factor goes down massively. The, the individuals, but still en masse, a lot of people are going to get burnt on that one. This is something totally agree. This was something that was a massive problem when me and Wong first were building the business in China. There were no, mm. there were no credit lines. There were no checking accounts. There was no bank credit whatsoever, right? The, the mm. credit lines were individual companies lending money between each other to help with cash flow. Yeah. And there's only so much extra money that you can allocate to give to someone else. And then they've got to turn it around and give it back to you. Otherwise your cash flow is dead. I still remember the first time. So sounds like the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love it. This is turning into a financial show. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that the problem with um where you've got a central bank that's not able to set central tax rates. Exactly. It's the whole fiscal policy versus monetary policy. People say, oh, but European Union should run like a, like a US of A. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, but they set monetary and fiscal policy. You, yeah. The euro can set fiscal policy, but not monetary policy. Well, Except monetary policy, not physical policy. One of the, right? You got a single currency, but you don't have single taxation. C correct, and you can't stop people from loaning money. So I, I always remember someone told me the example once. Um, Germany loans the money to buy German vehicles to companies that that can't actually afford. It then recommends from Germany mm. to borrow money from another country to pay for that debt. And it recommends that country borrows from another country. country. Right. And then so, that was fine for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like a house of cards comes flying down. But I guess we all know this now, right? It kind of makes sense. But now we've had this thing called quantitative easing. And of course, quantitative easing is a whole other whole bit of fun. Look, and it works, right? We were saying earlier on, it does work in, in the short term. Well, I, what alternatives have you got? Well, uh, well, you, you, so, you want to pump, pump money into the system because there's not enough money flowing through the system, right? Yeah. Money is a level of trust. You know? yeah. Fundamentally, it's a token of trust. I trust it. You're going to give me this token in exchange for that token. It's value, right? Yep. And when everybody, when someone's not working, then your risk factor goes up. There's less trust. So how do you yeah. combat that? Well, you start squirting trust into the system, give people more tokens so that <laughs> the whole thing starts working. But then if people don't trust the token maker. Well, then you have a problem. Then you have a problem. And I think that's what's happening now. Um, our big asset, I guess, inflation. So I, I've been quoted for saying it. I believe that we're in stagflation now. We're in depression and it's stagflation. Mm -hmm. So I believe... For those who are, who are on the web, we've probably got a whole bunch of adult coaches on the line going, what are you guys going on about? No, but yeah, so talking about? Yep. where's my emergent strategy? We will get to that. Chris, Chris Pope, we'll get to that. Honestly, we will. Um, no, but, it's, it, but this is all interlinked, right? All these factors happen and we've got to actually respond to these changes. So being aware of, of, of quantitative easing is actually quite important. But stagflation is coming. I, I think it's already here. So stagflation is, is that you get inflation of assets, Mm -hmm. or a devalue of your currency, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. Then you've got um, lack of economical growth, so therefore no jobs. So if prices go up, your wages either go down or they, or they stagflate. Yep. So you're in a depression, but prices are increasing. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, it's a double-edged sword, right? We had one in the 1970s, but we came off the gold standard and that fixed it. Well, we're off the gold standard now, so we've printed trillions and trillions of dollars. 
but people are going, well, then the money's worth less. So therefore they're putting more money into the stock market, more money into the, into the prices. Yes, it's more liquidity, but it's more liquidity of market that maybe actually is worth a little bit less than it was. So it, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting hypothesis. So let's try and bring this back to business, right? The right. impact for me, <laughs> I could chat about this all day long. I, I really could. I, I love finance. Um, and by the way, this uh, episode is sponsored by uh, Little Giant Barossa Shiraz. H hashtag not actually sponsored by before they sue me. Uh, very nice, by the way, for those who ask. Um, Barossa Valley, can't go wrong. Yeah, it's actually really, I get, sorry, guy, Australian again. I, I, I can't find a Shiraz made in New Zealand that tastes nice. Please, someone recommend something if it actually, <laughs> there actually is one. In New Zealand, head for the Pinot Noirs, right? If you, you know. There's just no body in Pinot Noirs. I just, <sighs> I, well, I'll test throughout the week and see if I can find one for next week. You, you, you need to refine your taste. I, I do need to refine my taste. This is true. I thought buying the nice glass would make me more the, refined. The, the heavy bodied pit of pepper. Exactly. So, this is what's happened, right? And this is why I really like the idea. And when Colot recommended me to you, I was like, yes, bring you on board because we get so many people who just think like me, right? We're just, we are, we're coaches, we're management consultants. Uh, we talk the talk, but you've walked the walk, right? You've seen things change so much. You've played the arbitrage game. You've, you've won, you've fouled. And we're going through another stage right now. Mm -hmm. Right, COVID nineteen. People are so focused on the virus and not on the economical impact, not on the globalization, not on the trend of people. We were joking about this whole um, uh, game stock, yeah. yes, which is the funniest thing I have seen, and it will probably be the news of this of this year. This this is entertainment, and this is a sideshow and it's a brilliant fraction, and you know, eat the rich kind of. It, it is. It is. In, in rebellion to the situation everyone's looking at, right? Yeah. Every socialist, you should be buying game stock. What's it called? Game, 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 supply. game supply dot com. I, I, I think I'm like, this is not financial advice. Please don't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> but this is ha this happening, right? People have realized the power that they've got. And I think, I think it's a little bit because they've been home a lot and they've realized how much influence they've got. Democracy, put it aside, that's, that's politics, right? Let's ignore that. Um, but actual people have realized that democracy based on money is far more powerful. Uh, Vodafone pulled their funding from MediaWorks due to a racist comment on one of the radio hosts. All right. People loved it. It was a brilliant strategic decision by Vodafone. I'm hoping they did it from a moral point of view, but it was a great strategic decision. Because people are realizing, like, um, he's saying Jonathan, CEO. I saw the post he made. Um, Jason, uh, he made a post on LinkedIn, and I, I love actually, you know, love the bu love button on LinkedIn mm -hmm. because what you're finding is um, you'll get hundreds of comments. They'll tell all their friends. Vodafone does this. That tell their friends. The word of mouth advertisement is far more powerful now than the actual media works would have been in the first place. Right, so people got power, right? So how do how do people how do companies now, Troy? How do we how do we um, survive? Let's go with survive first. How do we survive, Troy? <laughs> um, well, I think most companies, if you're going to get anywhere, you're going to have some sort of value system. You're going to have some sort of principles mm. as, as north stars. Yeah. There's the difference between principles, uh, you know, think of it as more like your strategy based on those principles, your tactics are gonna change, but where you're aiming for isn't and why you're aiming for that isn't. The days of, I, I don't think the days of just making money are over, right? If that's your primary guiding light, but I think there's just too much going on that without some value, uh, value structure, you're not going to be able to filter what the, the changes that are coming down the pipe, right? And that was something in China, it's a very pragmatic, pragmatic space. Mm. But, and, and people are very quick to, they look at things in the short term, not the long term. 
and it's a brutal jungle kind of approach to dealing with things. Well, westernized culture, when you look at um, um, Maori culture, for instance, a lot of Iwis have got 50 to 100 year strategic visions. Right. And I was like flabbergasted when I, when I heard about this. And then I spoke to a local Iwi and I actually found out that this is true, that they, they don't have the next quarter, the next quarter, the next quarter. It's about what are my tamariki and so on actually going to uh, live like? How does, how does that filter, filter the choices of decisions that they make on, a, on the short term? How does it it's, it, whittle it's, down? They're always aligning it to the greater vision. You know, how is that going to affect my children's children mm. as opposed to how is that going to affect my pocket in the next three months? Which is very interesting. It's, it's not very well known. And I, 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 it's, it's amusing because we're kind of going in that direction with business now, right? Exactly what you said. Have a, almost have a vision of values. That are, it's beyond the quarterly uh, paycheck. But yet cultures like... Um, I can't remember the actual wording, sorry, sorry for those um, talking to Fenua, but um, Māori Dom, I think, I think you might call it, uh, Māori Dom, they actually focus on that long-term vision, which means all the decisions they make today are about adapting for that long-term vision. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's very interesting, and it's almost aligned to how we speak about green cultures and about you know looking towards the greater end result. What do you think? Um... I'm familiar with reasonably long-term views, but not 80 to 100 years. But Crazy, I don't, right? I don't see how that makes a difference. If you've got a set of principles in terms of how hmm. you're going to do business, okay, then that helps you decide on which side of the lines when decisions come down those pipes and they're coming down all the time, yeah. how are you going to take them, right? One of the things surviving in China was we accepted responsibility for you know, our mistakes mm. paid for them, right? But we went to war with people that if it wasn't our fault, if, that, then we weren't going to deal with that. Yeah. And that rule of principle of taking responsibility for the mistakes that you've made and, you know, paying out of pocket for it, it's a monetary guide, but it's not a, a long-term um environmental thing if you like mm. or, or political endeavor in the early days in china it was just too cutthroat to even be thinking about that kind of stuff this is where the emergent strategies kind of thing came out we had me and Wang would sit there and we had this thing where we were petrified of getting stuck the worst thing that could ever happen was just not making a decision and very often decisions got hidden away or mistakes didn't rise up to the surface in time and they got exponentially more expensive the longer it took you to find them. Uh, yeah. Part of that process was we always had this joke. It was like, let's take one step, uh, look around and then take another step. But we'd rather take a wrong step in terms of making a bad decision than no decision whatsoever. Yeah, because the actual cost of not making the decision. God, yeah, that, that's the worst thing to do, get stuck. You know, we, we would talk about like, it, it's a gamble, okay? We go to the casino with, this is how much we're prepared to lose. Mm. Take, this, take the hit or not. But just standing around, not making a decision. And so this, take a step, look around and then figure out where to take the next step. That, that was our basic premise for pretty much everything that we did. Mm. Um, and we had to find all sorts of interesting ways of doing the finances and what have you. Now, this is where it connects into the Agile. I don't know if you know of uh, Alistair Coburn? Yep, yeah, I know Alistair. Okay. Well, sorry, I should say I know of Alistair. All right, so I- should say I know him. <laughs> I, I bumped into Alistair in Thailand. And, oh, awesome. And he was giving a talk and he was only answering in stories. So you'd ask a question and answer a story. And I turned up there, I put my hand up and asked, what is Agile? And he just looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And I was like, um, people were talking about Agile a lot, but I didn't know what it was. So I come along to a seminar to find out. Now, his thing is um, what he calls the heart of Agile. Right? And okay. the heart of Agile is basically um, 
talk to your customer, produce something, put it out there, nice, yeah. observe, you know, reflect on it. How can we improve it? improve it and put it out again and i yeah. immediately connected with him and said to take a step look around take another step look around and make decisions as you go and he's like yeah. it's pretty much our thing i mean that's how you know that is emergent strategy but operating yeah. on the sense of collecting the data just taking mm. steps that's not an emergent strategy that's yeah. just running blind but taking the time to absorb what's going on from your new perspective and your new situation. And it's really tricky when you get, often you'll take a step and go, shit, why did I take a step? That was stupid. What am I doing here? Go back, go back, go back. Well, the thing is, <laughs> you got new context and new information from yeah. that step that you didn't have before the step. So it was impossible for you to know that. If you did, you wouldn't have taken the step in the first place, right? But yeah. Your strategy then evolves, it emerges from the data that you're collecting and reflecting upon as you're moving forward, right? Yeah. And it's funny, right? Because I remember reading an article from um, Mintzberg and he said, it's in 1994, the end is nigh for strategic planning. Mm -hmm. And yet we still have it today. But what I think Mintzberg was doing is he was looking at companies like yours, companies that are up and coming, companies that took over the market. And they did. They dominated the market through 2000. And now we have Facebook, Amazon, everybody else who do use emergent strategy with planning, of course. But what they do is their strategy is to have no strategy. And you saw that on the bar, right? The, 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 the strategy is, you know, it's a scientific, here's, here, yeah. take a step, observe. There's a hypothesis getting tested mm -hmm. in that step. That, totally. That provides you feedback and data. If you're ignoring that data, if you're not analyzing it, if you're not reflecting on it, then you, you really don't have a strategy. There is nothing going on there. It is not agile because if you don't analyze what's happened, in order to make the next step of your decisions, then yeah. you know, there, there's, you, you're stepping blind anyway, right? Yeah, and that's Bassot's reflection, right? So if you're not reflecting, and, and, and for those who don't know Bassot's work, if you know retrospectives, you will know reflection, but a reflection is when you actually reflect on, on the step you just took mm. and take action to improve on the step you're going to take. And... Uh, when you read Bassot's um, journal on Harvard Business Review, you're just like, yep, that's just common sense, right? Yes. But Troy, it's not common sense in big business. And I think what's happened is the barriers to entry has been decreasing due to technology. Okay. Companies are coming in. The incumbents are like, oh my God, this is what's going on. They hire people like Alistair to say, hey, teach us this agile thing. Teach us to be more like the smaller companies so we can crush them. Well um, <laughs> here's a good story for you because like um, i liked Alistair and i said let's catch up because he was in thailand for a few days and he said uh, you, you know, i don't really want to go to a bar and i said well come to the gym with me he's like oh nice. I, i'm into that so i coached him how to deadlift and squat and bench and he was getting a little bit tuckered out in 33 degree celsius heat with a high humidity Oh, God. I realized, oh shit, you're not. Oh, he's like, he was like 60. <laughs> he's in good nick. Um, and he was like, he cracked them to me because he was like, oh, I, I did not realize he was that. Um, um, hmm, hang on. That's not, what's the other word? That's not old. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize he was that old. Wisdom. He, I know he has that much wisdom. <laughs> he's, he's a fit dude. He's a, very, he's a fit dude. He's a fit dude. He he set a world record for swimming at some point. But, wow. But he was like, you know, I enjoy the conversation with you because it's a little bit broader than with the software guys. And he says, actually, yeah. I'm a hardware guy. I was with IBM with their big iron. You know, I was a mm. supercomputer dude. That was my thing. I can walk and talk hardware. Software, I've been around it long enough now that I can talk it, but I don't walk it. Right? Interesting. And, and what you were just referencing before about large companies, he was with IBM, and this is the story that he told me, they were switching to services, right? Mm -hmm. His boss said, 
Alistair, we need to find out what the best practices are for services and software delivery. Yeah. And she put him on a plane, first class tickets, go find out. And he went everywhere for a year. He went to wow. banks in South Africa. He went to you know companies in London. He went to New York and South America and everywhere else on the company ticket. And what he found back then was like these massively well planned out, down to the detail Gantt uh, chart kind of processes were failing left, right, and center. Right, stuff wasn't getting out the door. Things had changed and no one was able to absorb those changes in the process of trying to push things out and it was just messy. And he said, you know, I went to a couple of different companies and they were doing really well. They were just sort of pushing out bits and then bits more and looking and a bit more and that worked. But they would, you know, he gets back after a year, sits in front of his boss and she goes, so, you know, what's best practice? He well, Actually, having no best practice is about the best practice I can see. And she's like, chin, chin. She's Brilliant. like, get the fuck out of my office. I didn't pay you <laughs> money. I need a report. I need something. <laughs> right? So he was like, there was a, he wasn't just on his own on this. There were, he'd met a bunch of people as he was traveling around, and lots of people were discussing these kind of issues and problems. And they went off, I don't know, somewhere up the north of the US, Utah, yep. Them and said, you know, we've got to, well, at least I do, I've got to go back to my boss with something and I can't just say nothing. So we've got to have something in a, a, an uncodified code or codified uncode, whatever you want, you know, like that, par it's got to encapsulate that paradox. Yeah. So that at least I, I don't get my ass kicked. And that was basically the manifesto mm -hmm. came out for him and that, part of that process nice there's a natural function of businesses getting larger is they get they turn into big dinosaurs with lots of tentacles and weird arms and bureaucratic structures that are, are large and they don't know what each other's doing and the communications get really complicated and siloed off and it's hard for a large company as a whole Mm. agile with most company structures and most company internal communications that's the nature of the beast right and why do you think that this let's go drill down there why do you think that it's almost natural for a big company to grow and become this hierarchical tentacle-like bureaucracy why is that normal do you think is it who's running the company or is it just yeah, uh, human uh, nature uh, well <laughs> <laughs> I mean, me and Wong knew nothing, you know, we were sitting there just building shit and mm. orders in and, you know, trying to figure stuff out as we moved forward. But the last thing we want to do is get stuck. And we were very freewheeling. Uh, I would sit there and interview five people every morning, whether we needed somebody or not. That was for, you know, morning cup of coffee, five interviews next. We were yep. growing like mushrooms. And at one point, there was no documentation and no structure. I'd walk in, grab a pile of cash, put it in my pocket, fly to Shanghai, fly to London, you know, business meetings, that kind of stuff. But over time, that's needed to be accounted for and it needed records for that. And then we had other salespeople going out and, you know, we would send a guy to Italy and he would spend up large for, and bring nothing back. So then you'd have mm. systems of, well, we need accounting for what you spent and why and who you saw. And, and then nobody would read that. <laughs> and yeah. the accounts department grew from a couple of girls in the back office to, to like 25 ladies crunching through numbers and procedures and processes for recording the records of the records. Yeah. So that at some point there was this imagined accountability. Wow. So, so even though you and Wong were pretty onto it, you knew that you need to adapt, you know you need to have fast test markets, still it became a, that kind of process, even as you as leaders? Is it just a natural flow? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? It, it, it was, a, I don't know if flow is the appropriate word when you start, you know, the natural accretion 
Yeah, oh, love it. Right? As you got bigger, you got more layers of paperwork. You forgot why that paperwork was there. But, and, and actually it was funny because even the culture itself, there was layers of it that were like sediment of, oh, I remember those days. And people yeah. had that thinking, right? But we weren't yeah. that company anymore and that kind of thinking didn't apply. And we would just push them off to a, a different division and they would do their thing because it was still making some money, but it wasn't the core of what we were doing anymore. Yeah. See, I had something similar to you. So I, I remember I was 19 and my first business that touched that million dollar turnover. I was, you know, it's always good. It means nothing. For those who are running a business, it means absolutely nothing. But you, you feel good, right? You feel good. Absolutely. It's, it's, yep. it's a couple, couple of extra zeros. And I started hiring people. And I started hiring people who, this was my, reflecting, this is my mistake. So there's interesting similarities. Uh, we got to 34 FTE and I started hiring what I class as professionals. I had a professional general manager. I had a professional uh, marketing advisor. I had a professional this, professional. Oh, this person's from an old, from a bank. Right. He, he, will know, he will know what he's talking about. Right. We had a family of 12 people and it was a family. We got drunk together. We had fun together. Like it was a good time. I mean, bear in mind, so my industry was um, poker, blackjack, nights out. Uh, it was fun, yeah. right? Yep. And then we got to 34 people and it felt like a corporation where people were getting fired for not turning up to work because they were hung over. And I'm like, well, I wouldn't care about that. Did the client care? Well, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, it's in the procedure notes. What procedure notes? Well, it's your company. <laughs> I mean, this makes sense, but I didn't approve this. You know, so... Oh, I didn't approve it? Well, oh, the hierarchy already. Why didn't good point. I've, sorry. Yeah, very good point. I, and I was. I was... Uh, so 19 through 23, um, I grew into basically a trustless person who didn't trust my managers. I didn't trust my staff. I didn't trust anyone. So I grew that book. To basically be like that was the rules this is what you do yeah. and you know what's funny that's what they did they didn't spend the overtime they didn't do the things the client wanted they didn't respond to the customer needs they did exactly what was in my book letter for letter yep. and you know what's funny we lost half our business in about six month period from a competitor yeah who brought the fun back so i feel you right um yeah. my mistake I know it's my mistake, but I find that um, I'm seeing that same thing. And what I'm hearing from you is almost is a little bit similar. Yeah, very much yeah. so. There, there was just that process of as the numbers got to a point where, you know, I enjoyed, I still enjoyed that space where it was the team, you know, the, the, half, the, the dozen, the 20, then you knew what everybody else was doing. Yeah. Right. And they knew what you were doing. And there was it was easy to communicate. There weren't silos of specifics. But once we got to around a hundred people, uh, yeah, I that's that number. Started to see people that I didn't did I talk to them before they got employed? You know, I was a part of the the the, the process of interviewing everybody, but then it and we ended up with an HR person who then brought them on according to a job description. Oh. And as we got up to 200 people, then there was people that didn't know who I was and wondering why I'm coming to their desk. And I had to go and navigate through the department manager who would then tell me what the team manager was, who would then find the merchandiser that was handling the order for the customer that was just screaming oh. at me yep. because there was issues, right? And then this person would go, well... What's this bow I doing sitting here, you know? Yep. Oh, well, he's the boss. He owns uh, half the company. Oh, yep. <laughs> and then they've been yeah. freaking out. And there was this layers of stuff that would just happen. Now, I, I, I'm the, of the approach that I like to treat people like adults and expect that if I treat them like adults, they will treat me back as adults. But there tends to be um, a level of skin in the game, so to speak, that is required for a certain amount of adulthood. There are, mm. there are large enough people that come from 
cultures that you know the, the cultures are already pre-existing and preset and it's really freaking hard to change either people's mindsets or the cultural mindset of a company yep right 100 percent. and the culture starts at the top you know if me and wong had a shitty attitude that would filter down into the kind of stuff that happens in the rest of the company yeah if you don't trust people your managers don't trust people mm. and so on yep totally agree and if people are filling out forms and paperwork instead of dealing with the real shit, right? Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of that forms and papers, at least for us, was we didn't have the tech. Everyone was running around with spreadsheets, right? I would die for a dashboard. <laughs> I dreamt of a dashboard that would just give me an update rather than having to constantly poll merchandisers and managers and department heads to get inputs as to... Where are we on this, right? The customer, the customer's polling us. Why can't we have the customer plug into this somehow? It just wasn't there, right? Yeah, just slightly too early. I mean, now it's obviously very simple. The SaaS guys are probably going, oh, it's easy. Data, data. Here's yeah, a report. There's an API for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's simple, right? I mean, I run my entire company with Cola, and we have no IT department. We have no... I have no directors here. Where's my audio visual crew? Um, technology is so freely available now. It's, it's a lot easier. The barrier entries have dropped a lot. Mm. So we're going to see more competition, aren't we? More competition, more driving. Is that going to hurt pre-existing incumbents? Like, as in... I hope so. Well, I hope so as well. <laughs> I hope so. Um, there is a lot of evolution going on. Okay, mm. it is the nature of big dinosaurs to be able to fend for themselves. And if there's a lot of little mammals running around their feet, good. The ecology, you know, because those mammals grow up and turn into dinosaurs anyway. Yeah. So there's always somewhere bigger. So you could be a very large company and then you get listed and you become a big listing, but then there's a hedge fund. But then the hedge fund has to talk to the insurance company that owns half yep. the thing and then the superannuation fund. On and on it goes. But we need lots of mammals because that's what drives. The mammals can pick up the APIs and start playing with them straight away. Yeah. Right? You and Colart can pick up, oh, let's play with this. And there's almost no headwinds. There's no feet stuck up to your knees and dry cement preventing you from trying it. Yeah. And we've made a decision. So when we look at all the research, and um, obviously, you see the research Troy, because Troy was a beta tester in our online business agility foundations course. Mm-hmm. Um, and We've the research showed very much, by the way. Nice. Thank you for the recommendation. Here, guys, buy it, buy it, buy it. Um, <laughs> but subliminal. Sub- subliminal. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I do try to keep agility and matter separate from Surge, but it's hard in this case. But Surge. Um, we've decided as a as a vision, we will never have more than ten people in the company. Right. Therefore, we must find partners for everything else. Yeah, outsourcing and that kind of stuff, or outsource it via an API. Right. Correct. A hundred percent. So we want a family, and when we looked at the research, we saw that teams of three and four make sense. Band of fifty, tribe of two fifty, organizational limit of six hundred. It's there, clear as day. That is there. Well, we so we had seven thousand. Yeah. Okay, but that's we had um, franchisees. We had ah yes, perfect. We, no, we had retail. We had manufacturing. We owned uh, three factories. We had contract factories of you know all over the place. We had all sorts of different divisions and stuff, and it was just trying mm. to figure out what the hell was going on. You know, 7,000, Troy. What was everyone's last name? Wong. <laughs> Pretty much. But, um, you know, it's hard, right? I mean, that's, what, that, that's why I personally want a family. So I like your franchise approach, though, because you create little miniature families. Did that work quite nicely? or The franchise, we went through so many different models of franchising, it was not even funny, right? Mm. Um, that was for a children's clothing brand called NGY. And we'd modeled that around um, 
our own in-house designs and styling, but then we weren't using the, our own manufacturing for that. We put that out to someone else because our own manufacturers, Good. the one, you know, our factories were giving us shitty pricing. Yep. So yep. we turned around and said to them, "Love that. we're not going to pay, we're, we're not going to put our orders to you. They were shocked. And we said, no, you, you guys go and find your own orders. Yep. <laughs> Which worked in our favor in the end. But um, I... You know, if, if that, that's one of the things I actually promote, Troy, um, internal competition. So you notice in the course, I say that a customer is someone who has a choice right. and is the end value consumer, right? If they're not an end value consumer, they're a partner and if they don't have a choice, they're an internal um, stakeholder. Yeah. Now, internal stakeholders are one of the most unproductive things you can have in an organization. Yeah. It just are. Partners are more, are more productive because there's choice. Uh, but customers are the most productive because they have choice and they're the end consumer of the value. They understand the value. So bringing the clo customer as close as possible makes total sense. One of my theories is exactly what you did. And that is basically say, right, your unit, I'll only buy from you if you're competitive with the outside market. Yeah. Well, no, they were structurally as independent units. And we just said, you know, single swim. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. I actually say the same thing with accounting companies. Yeah, well, the land that the factory's sitting on is worth more than you at the moment, so just do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. If you crash and burn. Mm. Yeah. So when, I was an, when I was an accountant, I used to say the same thing. I was like, you know what? If, I think it was Air New Zealand at the time, if Air New Zealand was to go to market on our services, it would be cheaper to outsource our entire department. Right. And no one liked to hear that. Like, oh, but that wouldn't make any sense for New Zealand. Why? It's cheaper. It's better. Less office space. The whole works. Mm. So because of that one realization, my team decided to basically up their game. Didn't work any harder. They just worked smarter. Mm. We became very, very productive. Um, and what we did over time was as people left, we never replaced them. Right. So we had a team of 12 and we went down to a team of four. And that was basically it. And Bear in mind, technology came in, so it's a little bit unfair to say that, but in a day, we became ourselves competitive. And I don't think we were ever, we're ever rewarded for doing so. Um, well, see, I got a fancy title. That's, I think I a, that's another thing. Titles. Guys will compete for titles. Women, uh, we don't care. Are we getting more time off? <laughs> no, and that's the thing. I think, um, and you can go down a, a real weird path of human evolution here, but yeah, on average, aggregatedly, aggregatedly, um, men seem to want prestige more than, they, than, than women do. Or I should say, masculinity wants prestige over femininity. That's probably a better way of putting it, because not all men are, are, have femininity, etc., etc. et um, And yeah, titles are an interesting thing. When Air New Zealand called everyone an analyst, everyone felt great. But yep. their role hadn't changed. They just got called an analyst. Yeah, the title on their business cards changed. Yeah. I it's, remember it's... I had one lady, uh, Lee Dan. She was lovely. She was super effective. And I just said, look, I want you in charge of the shipping, the you know, logistics. And she says, hmm. uh, okay. And then she's like, well, what's the salary in there? And I said, oh, pretty much what you got at the moment. Um, but we can incentivize it in other ways. And she did the numbers hmm. and said, not interested. <laughs> so what do you mean wow uh, whereas there was other guys in the department that were dying for the title and didn't care about the money she was more like well you know make, right. make it worth my while i said well the yeah. ball's more interesting it's more appropriate for you she said we'll make it more appropriate financially and I, uh, okay oh but good on her though because that's one of the leading contributors to um uh women being paid less than men is the fact they don't ask so I, I think I, I love that. Uh, I will quickly interject. Guys, it's nine o'clock. There are full 15 of you on the call. Ask a question if you want one answered because <laughs> there's been not one question tonight. Um, but yeah, I, I find that quite fascinating as well. Um, I, I'm loving, Troy, how this does all interlink to emergent strategy, right? And I was talking to somebody, I was talking to um, a couple, couple of coaches later on. They were looking forward to this to be taught emergent strategy. I was like, I can tell you that in a, a sentence. Adapt based on new information, done. Yes, that's, that was exactly, <laughs> exactly Alistair. 
Alistair was like, you know, I, he said, I would probably fail a scrum course these days because the 200 pages long of complexity and layers and hierarchies and accretions of sediments of things to make it look like something more than what it is. So I'm sorry yeah. I'm offending anybody in Scrum, but he was like, no, nah, you won't. Well, you will be, but who cares? That, that that was what the entire agile mindset was trying to operate against was the natural, mm. you know, formation of limestone. <laughs> yeah. That happens over time. You you have to blow it up occasionally, or you have to keep looking at the thing and moving around it. Some stuff. Just... But you know what's funny, Troy? And I put in the comments actually when you were talking. Does this sound familiar? When Alistair went to his boss and said, "Hey, there is no strategy. The strategy is to have no strategy. The the process is to have no process." Yeah, they threw it out. <laughs> yeah, she get the fuck out of my office. Go, yeah, you bring me something back. I didn't spend all that money on you. Give me a tangible step by step process. Now, the surge framework. We have a step by step process. Do you actually need it? No, mm. no. Have a coffee with me. I'll tell you everything you need to know in twenty minutes, and you won't need me. Right. But they don't want people. Don't want to know that. People well, like wait, structure. Wait, wait, wait. Now. On the theory side, yes. Okay. Now, then we jump to another wrinkle in the, the in the issue. Me and Wong would sit there, and things would get complicated, and we would look at stuff and go, "How do we do this?" Right? Mm. No, we would look for other people. We'd headhunt out of other companies. We'd get somebody. They'd sit there, and they didn't know either. We came to this thing. We had this description of people as handle builders or handle turners. Right. And often, yeah. often we were building handles. Right. Yeah. And we needed help figuring out how to put the handle together. We would get someone mm. into a large company and find out that they were a handle turner. They'd never built the handle in the first place, but they were paid good money to keep it turning. Right. Interesting. Okay. And we ended up in a situation where you have to be involved in your business to understand, to take on the inputs and mm. test them. And Bump into that I don't know factor and figure it out. It is a math problem, you know. It's a, it, it's it's a philosophical problem. It, it, it's a values problem. They all come down the pipe. Yeah. And, you know, you, your culture allows you to keep the handles turning, but those handles have to continually be either built something new or you know changed and adapted and still cranked around. And some people sit on yeah. the spectrum of they're much better and much more comfortable turning a handle versus some people are much more comfortable building. We're all, you know, I've got to do both, but we tend to sit one side of the spectrum or the other in terms of, you know, which we prefer, you know, do you like getting stuck into problems every day or do you mm. have to just do the same, you know, turn the handle and then, you know, if it gets jammed up, talk to someone else and they'll help you. Yeah. And, and this is about, again, I'll, I'll put a pun in for the business Julie radar, right? This is cognitive diversity. Mm. You need a diverse amount of people for every problem solving. Otherwise, everything looks like a now and you hit it with a hammer. Absolutely. And if you look at one of those on the course, you remember the um, concrete sequential uh, abstract randoms, that, that analysis? Yes. That's a perfect example. So I do that test with a lot of people. And the reason why I do it is because I go, right, this team feels really top heavy in one area. And I do the test. Yep, they're all abstract randoms. Right. They're all bloody creative people yeah. sparring around, driving me mental because I'm a concrete sequential to the max. Like I am, if it's not in a, a linear line, it does my nothing. <laughs> um, I, I can't help it. And if you if you waver from logic, I just I I, I, I freak out. I can't I can't. I'm, I'm I actually I'm on spectrum, so I find it very very strange. Um, like people don't think like this, but I understand you don't. It's fine. Um, but having that, as you say, a, a handle turner, turner yep. handle maker, you need everyone in that team to make good decisions. And I think that's that's very key. Part of the good decision is understanding where in the spectrum you are. You know, if you're comfortable turning handles, that's fantastic. Here's the paperwork that we need for the, the logistics for shipping, right? Now, this stuff's going to change from time to time. Cool. But on the, the rate of change, tends not to be high. 
Okay, so ah. go, go for it. Just turn that handle. We all, everybody employs somebody in the admin that helps them out. Everybody employs someone with, that does a lot, of what we call housework, right? And, yep. and then there's the people that are glue, right? There's yep. the people that uh, manage to communicate between the three, four, you know, the hundred or the, the, the team and the other teams. They translate and they stick things together. Then there's the people that just sit there and, you know, will cogitate on a tough problem and look yeah. like they're doing nothing for a week. And then you get an email and you're like, oh God, <laughs> you know, <laughs> put chalk mark somewhere and you're like, wow, that's where that handle fits. Well, that's how that part of the handle is going to come together. Oh, I, I totally agree, bro. I absolutely agree. I find it, it flabbergasting that, um, that one of the biggest ones I think is actually like, so I'm a talking thinker. Mm -hmm. right it's probably why i'm doing the show because it actually helps me think overcome problems i'm thinking of a problem as i'm talking to you I, I can't help it it's actually a really good way of me doing it i'm learning something new hopefully you're enjoying it as well people online hopefully you're learning something as well or just at least get a glass of wine and enjoy yourself okay. um but you can't ask me a direct question like that and expect a coherent answer i'll give you an answer i'm a management consultant i'll give you an answer but it won't be a very good one. I need to go away and talk to a bunch of random people like I'm a crazy person in the corner. This, that's me. This is, this is a really important point, okay? Because I ended up doing sort of consulting stuff and I would often sit there and think, why are people paying me money? You know, because my, my experience isn't blown shit up. You know, it, it's going sideways. <laughs> but, and it was, a lot of it was network effect. I, I had the network, the net was bringing in the work. But, um, where does, you know, I just got tripped up by that question there. What are your values, Mike? Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I, was, I was twisting over. Forget, you didn't see anything. It's is a mirage. I'll <laughs> oh, just let you know, um, apparently there's been a, a, com a complication with a live chat. So uh, Sims just come on and said that she had to exit um, back and forth to try and answer the question. That's probably why... <laughs> We've had 17 people come and go and we haven't had any questions. I was kind of confused. Um, so we have one question from Sim and I'll be answering that um, shortly afterwards. But sorry, go for it. All right. Well, I kind of lost the, the trail of where I was going with that one. Um, sorry. Oh, how, how people think differently? Ah, the, the, you know, that element of diversity is yeah. um, outwards facing diversity as well as inwards facing diversity. There was stuff yes. going on in the marketplace with our customers, with our vendors that we're oblivious to that other people from like, um, as, as a company based in Beijing, we had people from Russia and Poland and uh, the US and Switzerland, you know, myself from New Zealand, you know, we, we had an, an intimate, an eclectic bunch of people. Love it. Yep. Uh, you know, one girl from Pakistan who could drink you under the table at any night of the week, right? Uh, yeah. And they would often come with insights or data that beautiful. You know, you, you'd never, you'd like, oh, well, you know, where did you find that or how did you see it? It, mm. just, it was just like right there in front and you just don't access it, okay? It's kind of, it felt like a, a blind person has a different sensory exp exploration of the world yeah. or someone in a wheelchair is going to come across a whole bunch of hassles around the, the architecture that you just don't even think of. And it was that mm. kind of out of the blue, but right in front of your face kind of inputs that we were getting the more diverse the team. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting. That's why we use the word cognitive diversity and not just diversity. Because mm -hmm. um, what you can take this multiple ways, but the the way it was designed was complete diversity of thought, and that could be how you're upbrought, your culture. It could be um, your your upbringing and which school you went to. It could be what you've studied, how you how you've which books you've read. Cognitive diversity to fit the problem is what you need for every single customer uh, centric design of an organization, and. It's one. Of the, it's actually the biggest one. I don't know if you realize, Troy, but out of the four hundred people who have done the um, the business Julie radar, 
that's been the biggest bugbear of theirs. They hate the word cognitive diversity. Why? And I've always asked them why. Why? They're like, oh, I just prefer the word diversity. Um, and I said, is it because you've captured on to the media spin at the moment on diversity? Like you've bought into that, mm -hmm. but you don't understand the reason why. Like for instance, um, putting a customer on the board is far more important than having an even male and female board. Right. Put a female on, on the well, customer on the board. I have no problem with that. What I'm saying is, though, is, is diversity is a very important thing. Very important thing. We want to make sure we have a diverse board. But cognitive diversity is more important because if you have, you know, 50% women, 50% men, 12% um, uh, people who are not heterosexual, you know, completely make, it, make pro perfect makeup. Mm. But they all think the same, went to the same school. Mm. You've you have not got cognitive diversity. You have not got cognitive diversity. Diversity, yeah. And they don't have the same viewpoint as one customer. Who's correct? Who's going, guys? I just want this delivered because Sears is going to burn me if I don't. And you're not thinking about that portion of it all. You don't care about my pain. You just care about your product. Hmm. Which goes on to the next one, right? So, you know, customer experience over product centricity. All right. Well. You know, and the other thing, there's, there's a sort of a cultural thing in China is that uh, people don't, and I honestly don't know whether it's just China, I think people in general don't want to put on the table problems or mistakes that they might feel that they're responsible for. Uh, but why do, you, why do you think that is? <sighs> well, do you like being wrong or do you like making mistakes that cost money or do you just like, you know, does the boss ball you out or do other people belittle, belittle? There you go. Yeah. yeah. Your first two statements, I'll say, nah, I love failing. As I said to you earlier on, um, so I've had eight businesses, seven have failed. I've loved it. I love failure. Bring it on. Sorry, Carla. Let's fail again. Yeah. We'll learn more and we'll do even better next time. Um, I love failure. Sorry, but Carla won't let you fail. You know, his nah, nah, he, he, he's, a, he's a great business partner because uh, he's everything. He's, you know, this is the first time, Troy, I've had a business partner. Right. Well, I've always I, got it alone. Um, I... I prefer operating with a partner. Uh, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. And I, I find that, yeah. What are you finding from it? Having a partner it, versus not having a partner. Cognitive diversity. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what do you think of this? Uh, oh, really? You know, as, well, do you, out your mouth? Well, he'll, he'll tell me I'm an absolute idiot. Like, that's a bad idea, Michael. He'll say it in a nice way, of course. He'll say it in his co way. Um, in the you know the coaching way of um, and do you really think that, that that would cause the what is the outcome you're looking to achieve with that on that LinkedIn well, post? Well, it has honed this skill of listening and just you know threading things to just let it come out, and he's got a mm. great organic sense. Here's the funny yeah. thing: is I was away from New Zealand for thirty odd years, and when I first sort of landed back was a few years back, I didn't really have a network here; I didn't know anyone. Of course, because you've been away, yeah. So, funnily enough, um, I reached out to Alistair Coburn and said, hey, Funny. do you know anybody in New Zealand? And he's like, well, there's, you know, he put me in touch with, I think, Joe Oslander, and Joe put me in touch with Collar. And I liked these people because they've got that kind of mindset of just exploring and being open and doing stuff and they they handle builders, or at least they're looking at the handle and saying, "Well, if we'll turn it yeah. this way, will it continue to continue that that way, or can we pull it apart and do something slightly different?" They're they're, they're doing the emergent strategy uh, thing. Yeah, I, Carla is definitely that. It, it's it's unbelievable. He's skill. When he uh, agreed to join Surge, I was just like, "Really?" Mm -hmm. What the hell am I bringing to this? <laughs> um, and it's funny because um, he's made me realize, and he's made me realize, and he's made me groan as as a, as a as as a business owner that I have got things to give, and that's that's one of Colot's, I guess, treats. I would say is he's made me realize um, that I really this is this is what you need in business. You need cognitive adversity to actually solve problems because I was always hitting it the same way. Hmm. say seven businesses failed very similarly oh. each time i even tried the socialist approach i gave 
the business to the employees, uh -huh. thinking that that would solve the problem. Um, it never did. They just thought I was the boss still. Yeah. Even though they owned twenty percent of the business. <laughs> yeah, but see, the culture had started right from scratch. They they came Correct. on that basis, and then you tried to change it by by fear, right? Gifting shares out. There you go. You're owners now, and they're like. Let's do this. We didn't sign up for that. And that's part of what I talked about. We ended yeah. up with these silos and layers of people that were, their, their mental model of what we were doing was sort of stuck in a time frame. That's okay. We, we got used okay. to that. Yeah. And some people, we just, they were like a virus. We had to literally put them in a different office. And because they were old school and connected and they would trust, we could trust them and they were useful for certain things but there was no way we'd let new people in an office sit next to them because ah. they would immediately infect the people. And then we would have like, we couldn't, we wouldn't fire those guys, but whoever got infected, we'd have to fire straight away. Otherwise it'd go like wildfire. Mm, that's interesting. Mm. Um, Troy, we are quite over time. I didn't realize that. Um, bad facilitation, Michael, but I will ask, answer our one question. I do, I do wonder if everyone's asked questions and we haven't actually seen them because of the chat being down. Uh -huh. I wonder why the chat was down. But Sim did ask, Mike, here's a question for you. And we'll both answer it, Troy, anyway. What are your values? Well, we've spoken about a few of them already. Mm -hmm. So my values are strategic planning, strategic agility over strategic planning, um, cognitive diversity over specialization, uh, customer experience over product centricity and employee empowerment over hierarchies. So a slight joke there, Sim, by the way. So we have a thing called the business agility radar, which is the business agility values. And they're the things I do 100% believe in because they create better organizations. I'll give a quick view over myself. So my goals in life are actually to reduce suicides. So one of my big things of myself is I go through cycles of depressive and um, euphoria and depressive. And lots of people obviously on those cycles commit suicide. And it's very sad and it's very preventable from my point of view. What I've learned from this um, mind uh, set, set is that giving somebody a purpose in life can basically drive them away from making rash decisions like that. So... I kind of went, that's my guiding star, right? That's what I want to do. How do I, how can I help that? What can I make a dig in the universe on that, on that aspect? So for me, it was about, okay, you spend more time with your work colleagues than you do your own family. I can't fix the ratio, but I can fix the work environment. Mm. And I got to the point where going business agility is everything that I did wrong in my previous businesses. I did not have an adaptable, flexible, and responsive business. I did not have a customer-centric business, a people-centric business. I didn't have a family. When you create that, you get bigger um, employee satisfaction scores, which means they love their job, which means they don't want to go home and do bad stuff to their family, to themselves. So what are my values? I have a couple of values that link to that vision. Um, always be truthful. I will never lie. One of my biggest values I believe in. Complete transparency, uh, which is bad in business, actually. It's kind of like slam me a little bit. I'm always completely transparent. You, you want to know my strategy, where I'm going next? Just ask me. I'll tell you. I'm not going to lie. Um, and I, I focus on people. People over anything else. So, I mean, me and Troy were making jokes about how do we fix the COVID problem. And I even said to you, Troy, didn't I? I said, hey, you know, we've got to let so many people die. <laughs> however, however, my thought process on that is I'm trying to save more lives later. Mm. So I will always think of the long-term uh, impacts to society and mental health and lives than the short-term pain, which is probably where I come to in my fourth value, which is on objectivity. I'm very objective. I want to focus on the um, always learning, reflecting, and adapting to situation. I think that's it. I kind of made um, the more connect for you, Sim. I hope that uh, didn't sound too fake or rehearsed because that kind of is who I am. Uh, what about you, Troy? Troy, what's your, what's, your, uh, what's your values in life? Well, you know, finally you just talk about the, the suicide thing because that's a huge issue and I've had way too many friends uh, taken their own lives over the last five years so or, or oh, shit. less um but yeah that's an important one i'm just i think i'm old school i i my value is do unto others 
Love it. Um, I believe you've got to give to get, but the idea in living life is to have a meaningful life, whatever that might mean for you. Some people have all sorts of ways of finding meaning and that's part of life is figuring out your own meaning. But the values I think is do unto others and mm. trying to do the right thing when you can at the time that you can. Right. So I would probably vary from you in that sense of mm. if I'm running a business, I have interests that, that I need to protect. But there is a just line that if I haven't delivered or it's been incorrect on my part, then, you know, I have to honor that. That's part of it. Honor is, uh, you know, and respect and trust in business is the foundation of doing anything. Yeah, trust. Trust is a beautiful, trust is an absolutely beautiful value to have though, because trust we is, don't trust each other well, trust, in society. Trust is built on the expectation that we'll do the right thing. And we can, you know, um, yeah. as a value, try and do the right thing for the yeah. people that you can do it for. So it might be a little bit short-termist. You might say, well, I, I want to do this for you know, 2 million people die now and 400 million people die in, in the future. And I'm a bit more, I'm a bit more, I will try and do my best for the 2 million right now. Because I, those other 400 million, uh, you know, that's getting a bit too abstract for me. In correct. And I will not say you're wrong. And this is probably something I've learned over the years. Um, I, I would say my more, uh, adolescent years, I would be like, Troy, you're completely wrong. Get out of here. You're, 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 you're. But now I realize that life's not black and white. There is a whole lot of gray. And if you and me went into the COVID room and we said, you know what, let's talk about the solution, we would come up with a very gray answer. Mm. And as long as it had the outcome we both wanted, and it's good, we both want what's best for society, and we would come up with a better solution together than we would apart. That's yeah, and, and the solution may or may not look like what we either of us thought when we mm. mixing things together. A hundred percent. And this is why I'm a big believer in polarity management. It's a technique. Uh, you saw it in the course. I, I always give some um, conflict resolution. And if anyone wants to know about that, let me know. I'd, I'll flick you for free. It's not a big deal. I love conflict resolution. Why? It makes you happier. Mm. Like if you have A and B arguing over something, the main thing to look at is going, okay, what is actually the delta here? How do we get a solution together and reduce the and mitigate the risks together? It's it's not rocket science, it's emotions. We are humans. Mm. Humans are based on empathy. Mm. Show some. Um, which is, you know, again, for someone who's on the spectrum, that's quite funny to say. Um, but <laughs> we well, have high we have high empathy, by the way, but we don't show it. It's probably one of the biggest things there. Yeah, look. Internal to the company and external to the company, it was kind of interesting in China to see what would happen. It was like the Chinese mm. sit there and they would come up with set pieces. Yeah, We're going to say this and set the customer up for that. And then I'm going to say this is not available and therefore we need to use that, right? And it was a set piece. They were trying to push or railroad a client down a certain way. And then they would do it interdepartmentally. And I would look at this and go, this is getting all too Machiavellian. It's bad enough when you're <laughs> to external to the company, but when you're doing it to each other, it's just, let's go sit down and let's just put the actual facts on the table, right? Let's open it up, the, the, the actual problem set, and trust mm. that we can trust, trust. Do, Is that word again? It, well, trust that we can all do the right thing for each other it might be weighted more to their advantage at this point or our advantage at this point, but that's not the point, right? Mm. The point is, can we come up with a suitable solution? <laughs> My rule of thumb is if everybody's equally upset or unhappy, then we've got a reasonable compromise. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and, but they, it, there was this tendency to want to game each other. And yeah. I was like, you know, it's just, makes life even more complicated. The transparency that you're talking about is a hard thing to do, but it actually makes life a lot, you know, even a business. It, 
it simplifies things, even though from first blush, it feels like it's gonna make things complicated. But if we tell the customer we're incompetent because we didn't find the supplier on time, what are they gonna think? I was like, well, you know, I don't think we're the only vendor that's done that. Exactly. Okay. And at least it's the honest truth and they now get it early because they don't have two weeks of you playing some game and myself included. Yep. Then we've lost two weeks before we come to an actual solution. So yeah, I mean, like these, these values are very, very, very old and cliche, but they have, they stuck around for a reason. Yeah. And I, 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 I love your honesty on that one, but to your transparency comment, I totally agree. It took me a decade, a decade of failed friendships, failed, um businesses like if you were to go troy and talk to someone 10 years ago or eight years ago six years ago on who is michael law you'd have different answers i would change who i was to match whichever environment i was in i was a chameleon mm -hmm. and it wasn't until someone said to me about six seven years ago oh mike's great he's a chameleon oh and i was like is that a good thing mm. i thought Maybe that's why I'm having so many problems because I'm not actually transparent. And it's hard, Troy. The first couple of years of being transparent, and I don't mean radical candor, mm -hmm. as in like telling the truth, truth, hard truth, because I don't, I don't actually like that. I think it's quite bad. But um, being transparent in who you actually are as a human being. Mm -hmm. I, I give you an example. I had a meeting today uh, with um, Novavi, which is on, who's on the call last week. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we're setting up, we're looking at how we can work together. <laughs> you know, transparency again. Um, and I'm being completely transparent with them. This is what we're doing. This is what we're charging. This is our mission. This is our thing. You know, that, that just wouldn't happen in any other environment. If you were a butchery, like I used to own a butchery, you would never do that because you'd give information away and someone would use it against you. In our industry, it's beautiful. I remember uh, it was Hodia. He sort of just looked at me and was just like, yep, that's good. Let's just test it and see what happens. There was no just mental. There was no like taking the information and actually like using it against me. Um, and I even said to him, like, look, I, I'll be honest. Like I've been burned so many times that 10% of me doesn't even, doesn't, you know, he's always looking for a way out. Hmm. He's like, that's fine. It's totally fine. I understand that. Hmm. And it's like this, I'm loving this industry because it's like people are like that. They want what's best for the customer. They want what's best for the society. They don't actually care about the money or money comes, money comes. Like it's not saying we don't make money, but it's, it's like you don't focus on the money. And that's what one of those studies in 2019 said, uh, companies that don't focus on money, that focus on customers, make more money than those that focus on money. Hmm. I love that. It's awesome. Uh, Sim, I hope that was your question answered. Uh, we got a little bit uh, down in the dirt with our emotions there. Um, it was nice. Um, Sim says fab. <laughs> uh, and, and Sim's giving me a good idea, by the way. I'm going to do a... Uh, polarity and management in three minute video. I'll, I'll try and do this weekend for you, Sim. Mm. Um, since I'm thinking about it, so. Do it, three minute, that, that, you can cover that pretty. I can get three minutes, yeah, get a whiteboard. I like your three minute pitches. That's how I come across you in the first place. Oh, is it? I, I wonder how you come, I wonder how we linked at some stage. Like I saw this guy, Troy, popping up. I was like, oh, he seems cool. <laughs> no, so you, your, um, your, your three minute pitch. I was like, oh, I like that, that's cool. It's kind of that, it had that beat that, sort of covered one point pretty deep but pretty quick boom i'm not yeah. a video person i will never sit here and watch this thing ever again that we've produced <laughs> because it's i don't know an hour two hours of stuff and i'm just hour and a half now wow geez yeah. we've gone a little bit <laughs> but, you know that transparency thing or that that respect and hmm. <laughs> I can remember one time we screwed up and all something cool. And it was, I would spend a lot of time arguing back and forth with customers, depending on whose fault it was, right? And Wong mm. came to me and said, oh, you know, what happened? And I explained to him, and he's like, so does that mean we pay or the customer pays? And I said, we pay. He's like, oh, oh, oh no. Yeah. And I say, like, we did it. You know, I've, I've gone through the lot. It's not their fault. Often customers would make changes in stuff late in the schedule. And when you're manufacturing something, that just screws the production line completely up. 
and we're talking atoms here, not software. So once something yeah. cut, you can't uncut it. Anyway, it wasn't their fault. And I just like turned around and let the customer know that we would be remaking it and air freighting it at our costs. And he was just, that the customer was, he was the buyer for the customer and he was flabbergasted. He's like, you know, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, he says, ordinarily this is, would just be a drawn out cat fight. Yeah, and again, that's that's where you get to the that well, the thing is he came back agile principle, right? Co uh, contract, con oh wow, I should remember this contract negotiation. Oh, I've forgotten the the value of agile. That's that's an embarrassment. We'll, we'll cut this bit out. Cut, cut. Um, <laughs> uh, what is it? Oh, Sim, you tell me. Gary, you tell me. Greg, you tell me. What's going on? I'm looking it up. I'm looking it up. Hang on, hang on. We're not, we're not, we're not ending with a mistake on, 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 oh, for me. Well, look, the customer came back to me the next season and tripled the orders that he was placing with us, right? So it cost, yeah. it cost us up front, but then we earned the trust of the customer and continued Love to it. build the business because we took the responsibility for what was going on. And if yeah. you're and stuff with, with large numbers, you'll realize how sucky that can get. <laughs> and that's customer collaboration over contract negotiation. <laughs> I found it. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's funny. And I, I could talk to you for hours about that story of Alistair as well, because that's what's really, I'm collecting a whole bunch of neural networks, actually, uh, of what you're saying, because um, I've always found the Agile Manifesto so prescriptive even though it's not meant to be i found it prescriptive like it's values and, pr and principles and it's like why don't i remember someone saying to you once throw the bible away and just have one rule you know i'll translate because it's a swear word um don't don't be a dick <laughs> don't be evil google don't be yeah oh google, google yeah hello tried that didn't they yeah, I tried that. Caught, yeah, changed it because the NSA got out. Oh, um, but yeah, it's like, don't be a dick. And if Agile, it's like, just talk to your customer and adapt to what they need. Well, I think it's talk to, uh, allowing the adults to talk to adults, or, you know, in, in a sense. That, that's again, that's it, beautiful, yeah. Again, you know, everybody pretty much understands the hypothesis of, emergent strategies in the sense of we put something forward we check it we reflect on it and then we alter things according to our reflection implementation that's tough because a lot of that stuff oh but the paperwork's already done the rules have been like that for five years yeah hr can't agree with that or there's legal you know requirements that are and, and, and you see with the calls, right, what I talk about, the fact that some companies can't actually be um, business agility. And, and one of those reasons is actually because sometimes you have governing constraints that mean your industry is actually complicated. It's not actually a complex beast. And if that's the case, and again, Edward Snowden will probably kill me for butchering his Kinefin model. But I love talking about this way because if you have governing constraints, you cannot have pure um, adaptability, which means you probably don't need that that way, that that sort of that along that business agility way. Um, again, I I know um, some guys in the IC Agile who kill me for saying this, but it's like no, business agility is not for everyone. Mm. It doesn't make any sense change the rules, change the governance, and then you can start thinking about actually going agile. Um, we have another question, by the way. Like, S S Sim's got her, um, <laughs> Sim's got her thing working now. So she's like, right, question number two. Um, and, 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 and Troy, you tell me if you've got to go, buddy, because I know it's late now. Um, but do you think there's any difference between mindsets and values? Uh, yes. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Go on, you go first. You go first. Well, look, you know, values are something that you hold core, and there's cultural values there, and there's, you know, biopsychosocial models of values that we get instilled in us before we even 
we're, we're too young to even understand what those values are. Okay, there's certain expectations um, that that we live up to uh, that I would consider values, and a mindset is something else. A mindset is something that can be something that queries on those values, and I'm not. I, I'm saying there's a lot of good values out there, right? Hmm. Um, <laughs> values, and again, I, I, funnily enough, as much of as a radical I used to be, I, I kind of like old school values, right? Um, yep. Don't consume more than you need to consume. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, do the right things for people. Do the right thing for yourself. The, uh, be honest where you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that sounds like a bit of fudging there. And if you really, you know, that's part of the thing, the difference between a mindset and a value is values tend to be a lot more set in stone, whereas mindsets can generally flux a lot more than we give ourselves credit for doing. Right. Yeah. When yeah. That, that's the hard part. When the incentive goes against you, it's easy to drop the values. Right. When that order is going to cost you a fortune because you've made a mistake, your values are going to start costing you money and your mindset will swing towards, well, maybe the customer did this and uh, we can litigate it or we can argue it uh, from this angle. Mm. Um, so, yeah, two definitely different things. I, I, I think so as well. So from my point of view, I think mindset leads to values. So just has, again, for those who have not been on the course, I, I use the onions as an example, the agile onion. For those who don't know the agile onion, it's where you have tools and processes on the outside. You go principles, values, mindset. And I look at it like, well, it's the mindset that leads to values, the values that leads to principles, the principles that leads to tools and process. Your mindset is the most difficult thing to change. If you can change it at all, I mean, I'm... I, I, I use the quote, it takes three years to change culture in an organization. And I'll say it again, because I love saying this, right? I can teach you Scrum in three minutes. I can implement Scrum in three weeks. I can get benefits from Scrum in three months. I have a case study now for exactly that. And I can change your culture, your organization in three years. Mm. There's a big difference in culture. And that's because it's all about mindset. Now, if we think about that once the mindset changes, we tend to actually start changing our values to match. And this is where I ask an organization, what's your end goal? Is it a mindset shift? Yes, customer citrusy mindset, growth mindset, all the fancy words. Is that really your actual, is that what you really want though? Um, what's the objectives you're looking to achieve from that? And normally they, they want a value driven organization. Mm -hmm. And that's completely different to a mindset shift. So you could implement a, a value-driven organization within a year, two years, depending on the organization size and complexity and, and restructures required, et cetera. But I tend to find that if you want to change mindset, it's like three years. Uh, and that's because you're probably going to get rid of 30 to 40% 40, 40 of your staff. Oh, the, the, uh, it's easier to change the person than it is to change the person. And I don't, Troy, I never, I never recommend, I'll never recommend, I never will recommend um, actually removing people. I don't believe in that. I always believe finding the best value that they can produce, but they naturally quit. Mm. If an organization goes, so I talked to um, Niha, so she's on the Halloween special for those who want to look, and um, she's a HR specialist. And uh, Niha, we need to finish this. We keep talking about it. We started looking at how to onboard the right people, team fit, band fit, tribe fit, organizational fit, right? Um, and we said that, you know, the research shows you can't go more than one stage above the team, band, tribe, organization. And the same as like Michael Sahada's uh, work on bands, right? You know, culture, cultural umbrellas. I can't remember what he says, but cultural fit. Mm. Uh, I probably butchered what he says, but anyway, um, if your organization is a amber, you shouldn't hire more than a, an orange. You hire a green, you're going to basically have people leave. Same thing. If you take 
an organization and you start implementing green procedures, everyone who's amber is going to leave. And this is why I said to you in the course, like when we start going and saying, right, we're an amber organization. So we're a command control hierarchy organization. Mm. And we're going to green. If you move too quickly, everyone leaves. Oh, I've got a great story for you. Go for it. Go for it. I, I was you know, in the office and I was looking for, I think it was um, shipping or some, you know, I can't remember the, the role now. And this lady interviewed and I'm still at the stage where I'm still interviewing people and the company was deep red at the time. You know, most Chinese companies are operating on that red mode. Uh, you know, it, it's just nature of the, the beast up there. And I'm a foreigner, Chinese company, Chinese staff, Chinese woman in front of me who'd spent time in the US, a lot of time, studied there, worked there, come back to China. And she's great. I really wanted to employ her. I said to her, you know, you're, you're fantastic, but uh, you just won't fit in here. And she's like, what? I said, well, it's a really Chinese company and I don't think you Chinese that much anymore. <laughs> and she was like, what are you saying? You're a foreigner in this company and you're telling me that I won't fit in. And, I was, and she really argued the case and she was kind of upset about it. And I was like, I like it. Um, well, you know, I, have, I, I can float along the surface on a lot of this stuff. Um, I tell you what, um, I, I really want to employer i'll give you a week to see what you think right and i don't even i don't mind paying you for the thing just come in and see what you think she lasted a day she was wow. uh, she was like at you know amber and we're at red and she came in there and she just came up to me and she's like i'm sorry you know i just can't cope with this and you know that that's a classic example of as much as I wanted that person in the company, the company wasn't going to allow her to be absorbed into it and she wasn't going to put up with it. So yeah, you've got to sort of wriggle things along. And again, you know, this is how we ended up with parts of the company that had very different thinking from other parts of the company. Yeah. The HR aspect is actually very important. It's very important. And it's one of those things, if you have a company let's say 600 people, and you're going, right, my competitive advantage is decreasing. Mm. I need to do something. We need to transform. Okay, great. So you may go, okay, I'm going to just, I, I'm going to come to Surge and get a current state analysis. No. And you get a current state analysis, right? And we tell you you're amber. Right. right, I want green. And then if you go too quickly, you'll lose people. If you hire the wrong people, it'll go wrong. You restructure the wrong way, it'll go wrong. And this is the reason why I think it was like 80% of transformations fail. Mm. And they go, oh, Agile's to blame. No. You try to implement something outside of the requirements of the organization. And this is, um, obviously, I, I just noticed, um, I added Sim on um, LinkedIn and noticed um, the company she works for. So I hope, I hope you don't mind, Sim, I'll use, use it as an example. Um, I'm a big fan of actually scaled, scaled Agile framework. And a lot of Agile people will say, that's not Agile. No, you know what? It's not. It's not Agile. Hmm. What's great is it's a gateway drug. It is an amazing gateway drug. It is, it is the, what Alistair said to you and what you've seen as well and what I've seen as well, it is the structure that you require in an amber organization to go to orange. Mm-hmm to create a, an objective outcome focused organization, a first stepping stone. And if you do that, you will basically move from amber to orange, preparing yourself for the drug that you cannot stop taking because it's so intoxicating mm. of empowering employees to find the right ways of doing things to adapt to customer needs. Well, you need that positive spiral up in terms of the infection yeah, totally. going from you know positive to positive out into the broader thing but you can end up Holy. silos that isolate themselves they start punch ups amongst each other for no particular reason culture change is hard right it's yeah definitely really really hard which is why i love when we see like the rfps go on the um the government websites looking for a agile transformation to change culture done in 12 months 
Nope. <laughs> nope. Not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. Are you going to sack everybody and then hire everyone again? Maybe. Um, even doing that, even sacking everybody, still within the constraints of what that department's supposed to be doing? Yeah, totally. Look at Nokia. Look at Nokia. Look at Spark. Look at... Um, for those that know, Spark is our tele telecommunication network. But look at Nokia. This is Nokia as an example, right? Nokia. So I use Nokia and Air New Zealand as an example because I was, I was a shareholder of Air New Zealand and I sold based on their COVID response. Mm -hmm. And um, again, hashtag not financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will be a financial analyst in the next few months, but I, I'm still not going to take the... Anyway. So Nokia had its biggest... Financial years, three years in a, row, in a row, made a lot of money. And then in 2008, recession came in, and I used it as an example to transform the organization and take the 30% cut in, in FTE. So yes, they transformed the organization and got productivity gains. Mm. Well, I would say more they got efficiency gains, to be fair. Yeah. But what really happened was, is the employee's culture degraded. Oh, oh shit. Uh, who's next? Yes. Am I next? W when's the next culling coming? Mm. And I've seen this time and time again when you start um, removing people, when you start doing restructures that actually remove 30% of staff. Yes, you save cost. I t I'm not saying you don't save cost. But unless your strategy is actually to commoditize your product, it's a very bad thing to do. And then the customer, what did the customers of Nokia do when they found out they reduced 30% of their staff? They stopped buying the product. Mm -hmm. And as we said, I, I'm not sure if we were off camera or on camera. Um, it's been, it's been, we've been talking for like four hours now. Um, but we stopped. We, people actually control the market. So Nokia's sales plummeted because people didn't believe in Nokia anymore. Mm. Trust. And, and the same thing's happening with Air New Zealand right now. Mm. Right now, people look at Air New Zealand like it's just another Jetstar or anybody else. They've lost the competitive advantage of being a people-centric culture. So now, I mean, I fly Air Chathams, by the way, Wanganui, best place to live in the world. Um, <laughs> small little plug there. Um, Air Chathams took over from Air New Zealand, so we all love Air Chathams. But I have friends now in Palmerston North in Wellington who will fly Jetstar now because of the price. Mm. I said, but didn't you used to fly in New Zealand? Said, yeah, but I guess Jetstar is so much cheaper. I said, they've always been cheaper. Okay. Yeah, I guess I didn't care beforehand. Mm. And that small change of seeing the news saying they'll get rid of 4,000 people when they've had three, four years of their largest returns. They had a $1.7 billion ca um, current asset pool. And they sacked 4,000 people. I tell you what, um, I wouldn't have wanted to make the choice. I oh, God, no. I feel sorry for the executive team. I really do. You know? Like, again, uh, who, who, who is the customer here? Because when our customers aren't there, Right? Is it our yeah. stuff? Is it the <laughs> so, sorry? Is sorry, I just I just saw Sim's next next question. Jeez, that's a doozy, Sim. Um, yeah, but who is the customer? I, I totally agree. Is it is it the government because they own fifty one percent of the shares? Is it the customer though? Is it the New Zealand public? Is it the person yep. that buys a ticket? Is it the shareholder? Well, and this is the thing. So I go back to. My... The customer is the customer, and they're the ones that is most important. What we'll find, though, is in the short term, you will annoy the shareholder. Mm -hmm. And if your board is made up of shareholders, you will be outranked very quickly. So as part of my thesis, I found that customer transformations that invoked the, ship, the board had a negative correlation with customer value, mm -hmm. which basically said that if you was to do an agile transformation and you involve the board, you will get a negative correlation on customer value. And the reason why that is, is simple. The board want to see profits now. Right. And, and they'll stop you. That's their fiduciary duty. If you're, uh, listed, uh, oh. if you're a listed entity, your duty is to yep. make the most money possible for your shareholders. 
Uh, mm. there was, there, that's not what it says, Troy. It says in the benefit of the shareholders, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't determine a time frame. Uh, okay, so then that's open. Yeah, I think we've already. Uh, uh, personally, I think we've covered a lot of ground on the financial side. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I I, I, I'm going to have a conversation with you on financials. We need a different podcast for this <laughs> for financials because I, I did not realize that you are a one and. Um, you're like me on the financials. So, hey, we'll, we'll have one last question from Sim, and I think we'll call it a night. Is that okay with you, Troy? Sounds fine. Uh, because this is, um, I didn't realize the time's getting on a bit. Um, hang on, Sim, so get your question up. I have a fancy system, but I have no director. I need a director. Who would like to volunteer and come into my garage and become my audiovisual person? So, Sim says, and Troy, if you don't, know about this I'll, I'll give you a context i'm curious what's your opinion of the sparks agile transformation now that the initial dust has settled well i can't comment on this one this is a question outside of my belly wick because i don't know anything no. about sparks agile transformation whatsoever unfortunately uh, sorry so, so i'll give you some context from my point of view um because I, I i obviously i know some of the people who did it? And I know um, I know some of the engineers. I know all the people who left Spark, mm -hmm. uh, engineer wise. So Spark did the one big bang approach of an agile transformation. Right. They went from this day, we will be agile. Okay. And they tried the whole. Um, if you don't like it, you can leave. Right. And people left, of course. Uh, I had about three friends who left. Um, I didn't realize how many people I knew that worked for Spark. And uh, so, when was this transformation? Uh, you know, like <sighs> pre-COVID, post-COVID. Yeah, pre-pre-COVID. Pre, pre so this was, I think, it was. Um, it hit the deadline eighteen months ago or twenty-four months ago. Okay, All about right. that. So yeah, I, I wasn't even here. So, like, <laughs> I wasn't even in New Zealand. Has anybody noticed a difference in the service, the quality of the service, the attentiveness of it? The, the, oh, the, the, beautiful what, question. What's going on? That's, that's the only way I would notice, right? And that's the thing, right? So I've seen no um, KPIs. I would love, if, do you know what's funny? We should get, um, we should get the enterprise coach on next week. Does I'm going to bug him. The sim work for Spark? Or should I? No, 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 no. Um, so I, I won't mention the company, Sim, because uh, that might be bad. Sure, but, yeah, um, no, it's just, um, you know, Spark was New Zealand Telecom many years in, many years ago. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So and that was a job for life until they privatized or nationalized or something, and they split into Chorus and Spark. And, yeah. the job, and the job for life, thousands of people got sliced off the, the, the job for life. Yep. Okay. So it's you can almost say that it's in Spark's DNA to do these large transformations that are basically excuses of cutting cutting, cutting timber. <laughs> I actually that think that's a very wise um, critique there. Actually, Troy, is it in their DNA? Is it actually a cultural? Is that mm, that's a good point. Is that just how the board sees things? Let's do big transformation so we can cut costs and use it under the disguise of adapting to our environment. That's a, that's a very good point. Hmm. Well, they've done it a few times. Uh, they have. Your name changes here and there, bits and pieces. But again, uh, you're talking to someone that hasn't spent a lot of time here, so that's a total outsider's opinion. I use Spark. They seem okay. People in their stores are nice. No, Chris. So... Chris Tuhoy is the um, is the enterprise coach there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna, Chris if you're if you're listening or you see this, I'm gonna call you. You're up next I'm gonna, Friday. <laughs> I'm gonna get you in next Friday. Um, so Chris Tuhoy, do you know what? I'll give my view now, and hopefully actually he doesn't view this, doesn't see it first, and then uh, I can I can reflect on both decisions of what I just said. Um, so I don't like big transformations. 
The reason why is because the data shows it's bad. It's bad for culture. It's bad for productivity. It's bad for customer experience. It's not a good thing. Um, I believe in the pilot and scale what works, throw out what doesn't. But again, that's my bias and that's who I am. I know that Spark has a very bad, like, so in my industry, Troy, they have a very bad view. So a lot of people, a lot of coaches say that, that Spark's implementation was terrible, mm-hmm. but I'm a, I'm a data guy. So Spark is one of the highest people they've done to 25 of the people in organization, which is quite small, I know, but 25 of them did the bar. And they're the highest results out of all the telecommunication companies. Right. Right. Now, bear in mind, I'll, I'll caveat this. Um, uh, I need to bug Vodafone for some more results because I only got nine results from Vodafone and two degrees gave me one. Mm. So, well, then two, there's a low polling factor here. There's, there, there's a yeah. bit of a skew in the... In the... So, so please don't uh, take this as they're more agile than uh, the rest of the telecommunication networks, but that's all I have at the moment. And, if, and, yeah. if it's correct then they have a very good agile uh, outcome. Right. If it's correct and their KPIs are increasing customer value, I would say it's a great implementation. However, it's not what I'm seeing from the figures. I'm seeing the fact is that they've implemented tools and process. They've implemented a shift in their frameworks. Uh, they've got rid of 30% of their staff. Uh, they've taken the McKenzie approach to things. And I cannot see that seeing long-term customer value just the pr alone on so troy you wasn't here but the pr all the way through the media was talking about how um agile or go home Mm. was the uh the context i cannot see that having long-term benefits what jason did ceo of vodafone by supporting media works to ban racism Mm. will have a much larger uh customer tribal connection than any agile ways of working well um the, th- my, the question that comes to my mind is like you know sparks agile transformation from the, the small description you give me is a tools and process thing it's not a mindset thing i if yeah it's a mindset thing it's culture and if it's culture it starts at the top you know we've got the bosses of spark are they exhibiting agile I- mindset uh, entr- is that possible? And <laughs> one more thing, just before I go, because I really got to, I've got to. I know it's I, ten o'clock. Um, it's just gone past, but uh, China has changed massively, and China is the past mm. master at taking areas they call them special economic zones. They've got multiple SEC, SEZs around China. And they will try different policies there. They will, okay, this is tax-free. This is duty-free. This is uh, deregulated on this space. This is doesn't require that. They try it. If it functions well, they'll move it to another SEC, SEZ, you know, like another special economic zone. That works fine. They start rolling it out throughout China, right? Love it. They do these experiments, these let's take a step, let's see what happens. And then sometimes they'll try it in other areas throughout China. Doesn't work. The culture doesn't fit there. China's more like Europe than you would think, you know. That, so, mm. and, and they're like, oh, okay, it works in this area. We'll keep it there. Oh, it works everywhere. We'll roll it throughout everywhere. Oh, some places work. Some places don't. They're they're very good at not expecting uniformity. Yeah. So I just did a quick view. And I would hypothesize, and I'm going to try and get the Spark guys on next week, actually, now. Do that. Because, so, I went, if you go to Jason's profile, the CEO of Vodafone, he is constantly on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. And to be, let's be fair, LinkedIn is the new Facebook for, for like, professionals. Right. And, and he's so constantly on there. <laughs> well, we should go to Facebook because they're dodgy. Um, he's constantly on there. He's constantly posting. Sound, it says good stuff. He's leading by example. So the CEO of Spark is Jolie Johnson. Uh, Hodson, sorry. Um, I've gone back two months. She has had a single post. And she just liked a bunch of stuff. Uh, Some puppies from police. Um, 
Should she be spending her time on LinkedIn? Yes. That's a question for you and Sim to discuss. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think because that could hold, trigger a whole different conversation. But I would say the CEO's job is to be the chief influential officer, the chief value officer, the person who is holding the flag for the future. So uh, should we call it quits of that? We should. Uh, we should. You communicated that very well. I appreciate you inviting me on um, and call it for put, putting my hand up. And yeah, I've enjoyed it. I, thanks, I, thanks, Troy. Well, we, we must have enjoyed it because it's, it's been two hours now, which is uh, my wife's going to kill me. Um, <laughs> for those who are overseas, it's 10 p.m. here in New Zealand. So it's quite a lot late. But thank you, Troy. All right. um, I'll, I'll just sign off and I'll chat to you in a second. Okay. Wow. How cool was that? I, I'm starting to figure, find out that we may need a few more hours for these conversations because they're so entertaining. I guess some of my reflections from this. Did you guys notice how Troy, nothing to do with Agile, nothing, but yet came to the same conclusions because that is what is happening in the world. Since the 1950s, we are seeing commoditization of products, new value streams being added. We are seeing a whole bunch of innovations basically being taken by new companies and the incumbents being left behind. I am starting to think, can incumbents ever catch up? It's a reflection question I want to ask you. You let me know. Flip me a message on LinkedIn. Add Troy on LinkedIn as well. He's very active and um, we have some good, good fun on LinkedIn. So again, thank you for staying if you've stayed the whole time. Thank you for watching it later on if you've watched this later on. And good night from Agility Matters. See you guys.